Hi, I'm Councillor Peter Carlyle. I'm um, one of the Deputy Chairs of the Transport Committee with responsibility for bus and active travel. Miles Larrington, Committee Services Officer. Councillor Eric Firth, uh, Kirkwood's Councillor and another one of the Deputy Chairs with responsibility for rail. Councillor Helen Hayden, Executive Member for Sustainable Development and Infrastructure at Leeds City Council. Liz Rowe, Councillor on Bradford Council. Scott Patient, Cabinet Lead, Climate Action, Active Travel and Housing, Calderdale Council. Councillor Colin Hutchinson, uh, Calderdale's uh, Transport Engagement Lead. Councillor Axel Shaw, Portfolio Holder for Regeneration Planning Transport on Bradford Council. Councillor Matthew Morley, Cabinet Member, Planning and Highways, Wakefield Council. Councillor Moses Crook, Cabinet Member for Housing, Highways and Transport, uh, Kirk Lees. Kerry Peters, Regional Director for the East Region with Northern Trains. Uh, good morning, Brandon Jones from First Bus. Uh, morning everybody, Kim Kane, Area Director with Arriva. Morning, it's George Thomas from Transmetal Express. Morning everybody, Andrew McGuinness, CPT Regional Manager, representing uh, all bus operators in West Yorkshire. Good morning, Henri Roy, Managing Director of Transdev Blaisfield. Morning, Paul Turner, Commercial Director of Transdev Blaisfield. Councillor Andrew Lloyd, Bradford Council. Councillor Peter Caffrey, Coldale Council. Morning everyone, Councillor Annie Maloney, Transport Engagement Lead at Leeds City Council. Good morning everyone, Councillor Oliver Edwards, Leeds City Council. Morning everyone, Councillor Matthew McLaughlin from the Corn Valley Ward in Kirklees. I'm Caroline Firth, Councillor in Bradford. Morning everyone, I'm Helen Elton, Head of Transport Policy at West Yorkshire Combined Authority. Morning everybody, Mick Bunting, Interim Director of Transport Operations and Service Transformation Combined Authority. Good morning, Dave Haskins, Interim Director of Passenger Experience and Assets Combined Authority. Uh, and I'm Simon Warburton, Executive Director for Transport. Thank you very much. So, um, obviously we've got councillors from across, across West Yorkshire here debating bus and rail uh, and all those uh, impacts on passenger transport across the region. And we're ably supported by officers of the Combined Authority here. And also today we have bus operators and rail operators who are in attendance uh, for us to ask questions of them. So moving on now to the next item on the agenda then. Uh, we've got minutes of the meeting of Transport Committee held on the 16th of November. Uh, Councillor Hutchinson, you rightly pointed out something here. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, um, on page three, it says that, that uh, following the consultation, and congratulations to those who contributed to the consultation on ticket office closures, but it does say that at the last meeting, we uh, determined that re result that a letter would be sent to Rail North Partnership seeking further clarification on staffing levels and the provision of public facilities and how those would continue following the outcome of the consultation. I just wanted to seek assurance that that letter had gone and whether there has been a response to it. Uh, yes, I believe it did go and they have had assurances, I've had, at least had verbal assurances that they're now going to start recruiting because obviously there was a, a vacancy freeze, wasn't there, by the operators and officer in attendance and might be able to advise us. But Simon, do you want to update? Alguin, you're indeed correct that that, that is the case and um, it's referenced in the report as well around what um, the, the rail operators will be doing going forward in terms of the rail ticket office and, and as I said they're here today to be able to take those queries as we get to that point in the agenda. Thank you, well spotted Councillor Hutchinson. Um, any further comments, queries on the minutes of the last meeting? No. Uh, with that then can I suggest there's a, a, a record as an attached record of that meeting, all those in favour please show. Thank you, that is carried. Um, with the rest of the agenda, I propose a change in the order of the agenda because obviously we have guests here. Um, so I'll move the rail strategy update, which is currently number five, down to after number seven. So we'll go six, seven, five, and then eight, if that's okay with everybody. Um, and um, so we'll go first of all to passenger experience update. 
Um, but before I do that, I'd just like to highlight uh, the bus interchange update that has been distributed this morning to members. Um, I'm hoping you've had a chance to have a read through this report. It is something that I requested a combined authority officers to do to this meeting, because obviously it's been a massive inconvenience of Bradford bus interchange uh, being closed uh, quite suddenly, really, at Christmas time. And it's been very confusing for members of the travelling public <coughs> and, as I say, hugely inconvenient to their journeys uh, as they go around West Yorkshire. Um, so I've, it's such an important issue for Bradford and, indeed, for the combined authority that I wanted to bring it here so that members of uh, the authority across West Yorkshire could ask questions of the officers about what the current state of play is and how quickly we can get to a, a more um, stable arrangement for the travelling public. Um, so, Simon, did you want yeah. to just sort of start this uh, and then we can ask questions in subsequent thank you thank you chair and as you as you rightly say um it's very much been the focus of um the work of uh, both myself and um uh, and the team here uh since we returned um from the christmas break but what i suggest is I'll, I'll just quickly guide members through um the short note that we've circulated here which of course we will uh, subsequently publish um, as an appendix to um, to, to the papers um, on the on the website, um, so we took the uh, regrettable but necessary decision to um, close the bus facility um, at Bradford Interchange from the end of business on Thursday, um, the fourth of uh, January, uh, and that was following um, growing concerns that that we had. Um, around the structure um, brought about by a combination of um, the uh, adverse w uh, weather conditions uh, that are underway and the ongoing work uh, taking place uh, within the facility. Um, the short history to this is that uh, on the 22nd of December, um, quite a sizable uh, piece of concrete fell into the underground car park underneath uh, the interchange and um, I took the decision uh, to close the car park in the first instance um, for uh, public safety um, reasons and we made uh, the necessary alternative parking arrangements for users of the car park at that point. Um, we then instigated further inspections and um, within the capability of, um, of the team alone uh, we were unable to satisfy all of our concerns um, around uh, the structure uh, and therefore in the light of considering our public safety responsibilities um, we um, decided to make sure that no members of the public could be placed into danger um, and instigated a, an emergency operation and I'll come on to, to, to that in a moment. Um, members may well be aware of the fact that um, there has been work um, ongoing uh, on the bus facility, um, a business case, £8.5 million business case for that work was approved by the Combined Authority in December uh, 2021 and at that point was increased from an additional indicative budget um, of £2 million which had been suggested at the start of the previous year. Um, so that uh, work could be undertaken uh, to address um, the principal um, structure. Um, the bus station is highly unusual um, in, in, its, in its nature uh, and has buses operating over an elevated area um, supported by a continuous concrete slab um, and uh, above a cavity which has served as, as the basement uh, car park. Um, we have instigated inspection work. Um, we've appointed third parties to undertake the inspection work. Uh, that in itself is a challenging undertaking at this point uh, because of uh, the recent history in terms of uh, rack inspections, meaning that uh, that particular supply chain is, is, is very much stretched. Um, I only make that reference to rack because of some of the challenges it's bringing for us in terms of timescales. I should stress that we had already undertaken a RAC survey um, of the interchange and we don't believe uh, that RAC is 
is the um, cause of uh, the specific issue um, here. Um, the initial inspection that we've had um, has confirmed um, to us uh, verbally um, that we were right to uh, take the decision that, that we took in, in the first instance um, so that a full survey of what is in the order of an acre of continuous slab covered over time by uh, various internal fittings and so forth can be uh, undertaken. That is an inspection process that will take a matter of weeks. Um, and that was the reason why on the 19th of January, we issued further public information to confirm that the bus station will remain closed for at least the next two months so as to allow time for all of that inspection work to take place uh, and for me to be able to bring um, advice back. Um, we have had, therefore had an emergency operation plan in place um, since the evening of um, the 4th of January. We do have emergency operating plans already agreed around each of our bus facilities and um, our plan here has enabled us to temporarily um, operate the majority bus operations uh, in the Hallings uh, Nelson Street um, area and we've supplemented uh, that with, um, uh, with, with the use of the Jacobs Well car park uh, which is now operating as a uh, temporary layover um, area uh, and there is that there are a range of uh, incremental improvements that we've made to uh, uh, information pedestrian signage uh, and we've also had great support from our industry partners in, in that regard so it's a testament that at seven o'clock the next morning we had 16 members of combined authority staff there uh, but also significant numbers of, of bus operator staff all working very flexibly with us uh, to help to uh, advise the public and uh, we're very grateful of that. Equally, uh, we've had terrific support from colleagues in Northern Rail who've now accommodated a temporary travel centre um, in the uh, Northern Rail ticket office uh, in the rail station, which again um, is hugely beneficial for, for, for passengers. Um, we uh, have a daily liaison um, arrangement in place uh, with um, both uh, bus operators and also uh, council uh, staff and uh, we've now moved to a three times a week um, stand-up call uh, with uh, with bus operators and all of the temporary operations has been overseen by uh, by Mick Bunting um, and of course what we now start to do is to uh, turn our minds to what else can we continue to do to improve and just through the last week We've put additional arrangements in place to make sure that local businesses can be best serviced while protecting passengers uh, and so forth. And we're very clear that our objectives are as follows. So firstly, to protect public safety um, in the area. Secondly, to ensure um, that we can assist the council in managing traffic um, in the area, recognising the importance of us continuing to progress with the Transforming Cities Fund works that are underway um, in that area and also the work to uh, remove the former uh, NCP car park on the corner of Hallings uh, and Nelson Street. Um, we are conscious of uh, the potential for wider congestion impact in the city centre and again working closely uh, with council colleagues um, on that. Uh, and what we now uh, look to do is to continue to develop a facility that can uh, be best managed in the interests of uh, passengers, operators and, and the city centre as a whole. Um, the second key area of work has been around uh, assets and, and estates. The, uh, the interchange sits adjacent to uh, a number of um, uh, uh, operating uh, buildings uh, and we also have um, tenants um, who have been trading um, out of the, uh, uh, the interchange area. Um, so we've looked to make sure that all of those um, interests are kept um, up to date on the operation and our anticipation in terms of any impact on business. Um, and we are also, um, uh, through that work, um, managing down for the time being the work that was previously underway 
um, on the interchange and um, all of uh, that work is being overseen by uh, Dave, uh, Dave Haskins um, and his team, including now the, the inspections work. Um, we have looked to uh, maintain regular uh, communications and Nick Appleyard, who heads our Combined Authority Communications team, um, has overseen that work, looking to stay closely with both the council um, and operators. Um, we do recognise that there will be costs and impact associated um, with um, these uh, arrangements, that there are lost uh, revenues uh, both to ourselves and also um, to the council. Uh, and clearly we recognise that there are third parties um, on our premises as well um, who will uh, face uh, issues uh, in that regard. Uh, and so we are, uh, and, and there are also, there will also be costs associated with the interim arrangements that we put in place and also um, costs that, that may follow if there is any knock-on impact for uh, the current contracts for other works in the city centre, but we are, um, as I stressed before, looking to manage those um, very closely. So uh, we've established a mechanism to, to capture all of these costs. Uh, we will be noting in the budget uh, report to the February Combined Authority um, that there will this will present an additional budget item um, for the Combined Authority budget, um, and then we will look to bring forward some form of initial estimate um, on that in a, an update report to the Combined Authority um, in March. Um, finally, all aspects of the operation, the engagement, um, are uh, being overseen by a gold command arrangement that we've stepped up inside the organisation since the uh, 4th of January. Um, I chair that and we're also, um, I also, um, I'm running a, a twice weekly gold interface um, session with um, uh, lead officers uh, within the council. Um, happy to take any questions, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, so, this obviously, I said uh, my opening remarks, is hugely inconvenient for people. I suppose from my point of view, first of all, what kind of measures are we putting in place to see what the customer experience is and how can we improve it? Because obviously, I've, I'm getting messages from people on a, a daily basis saying, you know, when is it going to be sorted? How do I do X, Y, and Z? Uh, and I want to have some kind of measure about how they're experiencing things as they go forward. So any improvements we need to make, we need to make them quickly. Sure. Thanks, Chair. Um, so we've got officers on the ground who are speaking to passengers at various stops and locations throughout the city. Um, we are enhancing our offering the rail rail station in terms of the travel temporary travel centre option that we've got there for available for passengers. Um, and um, we, we continue to work with operators to ensure that the that the disruption plan is 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 working and that uh, we're monitoring um, data and information about um, journeys to ensure that performance is where we need it to be. So um, we, we've got that constant interface with passengers. We are working closely with them. We are speaking with them, but completely understand that, particularly in the early stages of the disruption plan, where there was some confusion, as, as, as can be understood, um, with passengers, that we needed more people on the ground to, to have that interface with them. We are finding, through anecdotal evidence, um, from speaking to people, that they are now settled with the cu current arrangement. So that's not um, breeding any complacency from us. We're, we're um, working on our next phase um, disruption plan that will work alongside officers of the council that will allow us uh, and, and the council to develop its TCF plans and the, the works in the city so that we can work in harmony with that and with operators. So there is a, a large amount of work ongoing. We've also got our accessibility coordinator who's working closely on the ground to work with accessibility groups and speak with people who, have, who may have additional needs uh, with their transport and putting mitigations in place with those as well. We've got a health and safety team on the ground and I've got um, a, a further meeting with my officers on um, Wednesday with, with a list of um, issues that have been um, identified to ensure that all mitigations are being and continue to be put in place to, to ensure that the um, passengers are, are, are safe as well as accessibility issues are, are taken care of. So, we're continuing to engage with the public, with operators and with council officers to ensure that everything that can be done is being done to ensure that passenger experience is as, as good as it can be. So if we can have some kind of 
measure as we go on so that we as politicians can just see how that is improving over time that will give us some reassurance i think and obviously uh, people who are regular bus users may be getting used to things but what about obviously new people as well who might be trying the bus out for the first time that's what people to do is it going to be more difficult for them to actually enter the bus market if you like because there isn't a central bus station for them anymore. And so the magic question is, how long is this disruption going to last, I suppose? You, you, you'll probably be aware I can't answer that specific question, um, Councillor Hinchcliffe, but what I can say is that it's it, it, in terms of my uh, element of the um, operational planning and the disruption plan around this, um, central to that is the passenger experience so so in terms of new people coming into the network and, and attracting people into public transport now that we as, as simon said at the beginning we're aware that we're staying at jacob's well for the for the next two months and, and, and potentially beyond that we are now setting up a more um, permanent temporary fixture at the rail station in terms of the um, passenger information facility that we've got there so we're doing everything we can to make it as easy as we can for passengers and we've got people um, deployed around the city as well as around the interchange as well and we'll continue to do so and as our disruption plans change we'll ensure that we enhance that offer um, on the ground. I've got a, a, a number of operational leads who I have daily contact with, I've got daily um, stand-up calls, one of those leads is about the resource planning and, and his role is to ensure that the passenger needs are taken care of and that we've got the right people on the ground to deal with those issues so I can give you that assurance at least time is yet uncertain is what you're saying um other questions points councillor Rushshaw. thank you chair um just start actually thank um, your access accessibility team who went on site after some concerns were raised about the routes as well and they went on site really fast so that was really appreciated um just on the on the survey i guess and the length of time it'll take so obviously we're saying two months and it's close to two months but presumably um, and it's just about how we frame it to the public as well. But presumably that survey is not going to come back and say, actually, it was all all right all along and you'll be able to reopen it. So there's an indeterminate amount of time after that where works, if possible, will have to be undertaken. I'm get, I don't, obviously don't want you to make a comms announcement now, but I think it's important that we kind of acknowledge that because if we're not careful, we're kind of saying, just as you did then, Jacob's well for two months. But in reality... Um, if it survey is going to take two months, we can presume there's some significant works to follow. And I think part of the issue with the communications is the public are kind of sensing that. But because we're not kind of able in part to, to frame that appropriately, that's where people think something else is going on and therefore we will kind of want to avoid that. So um, I guess it's m almost more of a comment than a question because I know full well you won't be able to say, oh, and we think it'll be this long after it. But it's just really to underline the importance of that framing because it, it, when I speak to people I say well we can all read between the lines and understand this could be a significant length of time and everyone accepts that but the conversations are starting from a place of frustration at a perceived lack of information because of the nature of, of how hard it is to to provide that. Um, could you provide us a bit more uh, information on the overlap with our transforming cities work in the city centre because that's obviously really vital as we go into city of culture 2025 the time scales were tight already um, and it's a really good scheme that's going to deliver those good outcomes but um, there's obviously a lot of interaction with the interchange in that and it's mentioned a little bit in the report but could you just provide a bit more detail on that please uh, yeah certainly so um, colleagues may well uh, want to add just on the uh, the, the issue of, of timescales, you, you're absolutely right, Councillor, that, that at this stage um, we don't know um, for certain the nature of works um, that will be needed to um, put whatever, whatever issues we find right. You're absolutely right to point that we need to plan for a series of scenarios and, and that's, that's precisely um, what we are, are doing now. So, so this two-month period gives us the time to have set out very clearly between ourselves, um, the uh, council officers and, and also uh, colleagues in, in, in bus companies, how we would respond to a series of different scenarios arising from the inspections um, programme. Uh, and we are very, very conscious of the fact that within that, we now need to have options that we could um, genuinely mobilise um, 
that would um, safeguard the presentation of the city centre for Bradford 2025 should um, the in inspection prove to uh, demonstrate that there are very significant um, issues to, to, to be addressed. So that is very much um, the focus of, 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 of the work now. Um, in terms of uh, transforming cities works on um, on haulings um, as as things stand at present um, the uh, the traffic management plans are such that um, the program was looking to retain bus access through haulings um, uh, and therefore um, it, it coincides um, what we want to make sure um, is that there's um, the right understanding of what's also needed at the same time in terms of uh, the bringing down of, of the car park. So from a TCF perspective, I think we're comfortable with highways officers um, in, in the council that that, that, that that is manageable. We're, we're making sure that we're absolutely right as well in terms of the removal of the structure, which of course is critical in terms of the presentation of the city centre. Yeah, I mean, just to come back, I guess the, the key milestone is it's coming up in March when the bus changes come in all together. So that obviously will be a moving feast for now, but that's the key thing I think we'll all be aiming for. Thank you very much, Councillor Rushshaw. Any more questions or comments from people? Councillor Fair? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, my question is more about people. So in terms of Bradford Council officers, how many people, how many officers have been taken <coughs> from my role at the moment within the council, particularly things about wardens, etc. Um, what is the plan for the combined authority to um, redeploy uh, WICA staff to cover those roles so that wardens aren't taken away from their role for two months in what is one of the most highly populated and busy wards in the district? Thank you, Councillor. That's uh, a good question. So we are working very closely. At, uh, as Simon said, we've got a, a, an interface with our Gold Command team between ourselves and um, senior Bradford Council colleagues, and this is um, this is one of the resource planning is a standard agenda item on there. So it's something that we are mindful of, um, and we've also got operational teams who are working together to ensure that workloads are, uh, are managed, monitored, and that we look at the longer term going forward in terms of. Again, linking into um, Councillor Rothshaw's uh, point as well, in terms of the um, future planning from an operational side, understanding that we don't know the long-term um, prognosis on, on the situation, there's a number of, number of scenarios that we're planning for so that any eventuality is covered, and one of those key areas in that operational planning is, is about resources. So um, I can't give you a specific um, view on what that's going to look like going forward, but we are working really closely with the, the Council and understanding that we need to balance the, the pull on their resources with, with, with their other um, statutory and, and, and other functions within the council, and it is a key part of our resource planning in, in both the operational elements and the goal command. So it is, it is being looked at. So how many Bradford Council staff have been taken away on a daily basis to um, be around the city centre, <coughs> helping, to, helping people to navigate? I think if I could come back to you with a specific number, I think it's difficult to give a specific number because we're using and we're working um, with Bradford colleagues for different things at different times. So to give a, a specific number of, of staff that are fully deployed to this and, and, and to answer that question in, with any degree of accuracy, if I can go back to colleagues and get that information for you, that will perhaps be the most prudent way of answering that one. Thank you. I think that will be key for members in Bradford to be kept up to date on that um, because... It is a question that's going to be asked and it has a massive impact on resource potentially. Thank you, Councillor Firth. I mean, I think it's a good point to say, actually, if it is going to go on for a length of time, then those staff need to be backfilled. We can't just take them off from their duties, uh, you know, without backfilling those staff. Because there is ongoing need, ongoing lots of work for wardens to do across the district, and obviously in city ward, as Councillor Firth says. So that is something that needs looking at, actually, just to support those people. Any more comments or questions on this item? No, I mean, if this is obviously going to be something that comes back on a regular basis yes. now. So obviously, this is a combined authority asset that is going to need a significant amount of yes. investment. It is significant disruption for Bradford. There's significant ongoing people costs to make sure that, you know, other Bradford council responsibilities are not diverted from to, to support this work. So uh, let's keep revisiting this and make sure that there's a solution to it. But of course... And we just a bit of a plea on the communications that we communicate yeah. regularly. 
uh, as Councillor Rochaw says, we need to be really, you know, ongoing. Even if there's nothing to say, we need to say there's no update this week kind of thing. So yeah. there probably needs to be a regular notes on the combined ferry website or through bus um, timetable channels to say this is what's happening this week um, and a bit of a feedback loop to us so we can actually make sure people are comfortable navigating the way around Bradford City Centre and getting onto buses um, and if there's any learnings we can take as we go on let's take those and implement change uh, so let's just make sure that happens thank you very much um, so moving on now then to the rest of the report, uh, which is also passenger experience update. We do have uh, bus operators here and train operators. Uh, they've already introduced themselves at the start of the meeting. Thank you very much for coming today. Um, we'll, I think we should probably put it in two halves, do bus first and then, then rail if that's all right. Um, so um, if we want to start with um, the bus operation updates from a passenger experience point of view. Dave, do you want to? I'll certainly do that. I'll give a, a, a very brief overview. It's, it's quite a, lo a long report. It's probably a bit less dramatic than what we've just been, been hearing about, but no, no less important as it relates to the pass passenger experience out there in West Yorkshire. So starting with, with the bus, um, uh, some key, key points in the report. Weekday bus use in West Yorkshire, 87% uh, of baseline now compared to pre-pandemic, and at weekends it's up to 89%. Uh, that compares to 82% last year, so we've seen some, some, some steady growth over that period, and indeed the park and ride sites are at 81%, so there is, there is improvement overall. Um, in terms of service, service changes, we've already referenced uh, the work that's been going on in Bradford, and there's a link at 2.9 to a, a full details of all bus service changes across West Yorkshire. Moving on to the uh, bus network performance, obviously we have the bus operators in the room will be able to answer, answer questions around these, these points. But set out in the table below 2.11, uh, sets out going back to the period between July and September, bearing in mind there may be some more recent information now available. Uh, reliability and punctuality figures are, are falling low, lower than the expectation in terms of what we're expecting. We're expecting reliability to be at 99.5 and punctuality 95. Also notable is, is the, the drop in punctuality between August and September down to below 80% there. So it's, so it's a, a, quite a significant change over the full period. Moving on to real-time information, um, members will be aware we've previously given updates on the real-time information system, and in particular uh, what we often refer to as the ghost bus problem, where passengers are standing at bus stops and not, not getting the information they feel they're getting. We've undertaken quite a bit of work over the last number of months, uh, working very closely with bus operators to understand um, <coughs> what, the, what the primary causes are and looking at some solutions as part of that. Um, there are still some issues around ghost buses, which relate to um, the recording of cancellations of buses in a timely manner. Um, obviously, if buses aren't cancelled on the system, they then still show up on, on street for people, and that's, that's at the root of some of the problems. Uh, this, 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 this has improved over time, it's pleasing to say, and I think some of that is a result of the close partnership working that, that's taken place there. We also identified some system, system issues which can improve in, in, on the technology side, so, so we're, we're confident there, there'll be some quite significant improvements over time around around the uh, real-time information system moving on to the uh in terms of what we call fair and pricing um what i'll do here is i'll bring in a little bit of information in from the following report which is the the, the bsip bus service improvement plan report where it references um the mayor's fares in particular we'll start off with a very brief overview from andrew because some survey work's been undertaken with passengers to understand the benefits of mayor's fares and then once Andrew's introduced that bit, I'll go on to talk about what changes have had to be made uh, to fares and pricing in general in, in, and about to come into play. Hi, good morning everyone. Andrew Fitzpatrick from uh, West Yorkshire Combined Authority. So I manage the research and spatial intelligence team here. Um, so we've run online, uh, we've run, used an online panel survey. I'm going to share my screen to, um, to share some results. These are, are, are in item number seven, appendix two. So I'm just going to whiz through these. That's okay, because I'm just going to use the same slides that are on there. Um, so we used a, uh, an online panel in October um, to assess the impact of Mayor's Fair. So there's three reasons for doing this. One, it provides kind of local evidence. Um, two, we've got nothing in the patronage data that specifically attributes the impact of Mayor's Fairs to the patronage change. So there's that disentanglement element of the COVID recovery versus the impact of the Fairs initiative. Um, and we want to, to explore people's perceptions about the impact on the kind of cost of living crisis. I'm not going to go through all the slides, apologies if I'm speaking quickly, that they are in the pack. But first off, we asked about awareness. 
Uh, so you see on screen on the pack that we've got um, the majority of people saying that they are aware, and this rises to 78% for uh, regular users. Regular users uses the BSIP definition of those people who use the bus at least once a week. So a good amount of people who are aware note that just over a third of people who, um, who basically never use a bus um, are, are still aware of, um, of, of, the, uh, of the intervention. Um, so here we asked whether people um, had increased their bus use versus before mayor's fares. That was before September 2022. And this is across the whole sample of 1,000 people. I should say this is 19 to 65-year-olds. Uh, this is turn up and go fare paying uh, passengers. And it is weighted by age, gender, district and ethnicity to be representative, uh, to be a representative sample. So here we see uh, that when we asked people whether they were using the bus more or less, so we've got 25% of people who are saying they're using the bus more than before September last year. So you see that's a net gain versus the proportion who said that they're using it less. When we explore that uh, in a little bit more detail, we then ask those 25% uh, those of the sample uh, whether that was because of uh, the Fair Cap initiative. And 67%, so two-thirds of those people, um, said that they were using the bus more because of mayor's fares. And what you see on the right-hand side um, is we asked people what, how they were making those journeys um, before mayor's fares to, to look at whether there had been mode shift, whether there was new journeys. And you can see there there has been a shift, um, at least self-reported, um, from particularly passengers using the car, younger people using the car, um, using mayor's fares. Um, I should say that um, actually that, um, that figure kind of rises depending on a, a couple of uh, kind of demographic attributes. So younger people are using the bus more, or they're saying they're using the bus more because of mayor's fares. Um, people of particular ethnicity, so particularly black, black British, Caribbean, African backgrounds are using the bus more because of mayor's fares. Um, and I should also say that regular users, people who are already using the bus quite a bit, at least once a week, are using the bus more. So it's not necessarily you've introduced lots of new people, but people are basically using the bus more. Um, I won't go through all of these, but there is a degree of um, the people who are using the bus the same amount, we pose to them the same question, whether they're using the same, you know, whether they're using the bus the same amount as before mayor's fares, whether that, you know, whether that had influenced their decision. Um, so you see on here, so 38% of the, almost half of the overall respondents um, said they were using the bus the same amount, have attributed that to the uh, two mayor's fares. So it's essentially a retention element here too. Um, we asked about bus use uh, for those people who, the 19% who are using the bus less, and the majority of this was came down to kind of personal circumstances. There is a certain proportion who do state they using the bus less often because of reliability and punctuality issues, but the majority of them are a change in personal circumstances. If we combine that data together, what we can say is out of the whole sample, so just over a thousand people, uh, we can say that 35% of those are either, number one, using the bus more because of mayor's fares or have retained in terms of being a customer on the bus because of mayor's fares. Finally, um, we asked them to a series of questions about the potential impact, uh, particularly in light of the cost of living crisis in relation to mayor's fares. Uh, so you can see there kind of a positive um, suite of, um, uh, of results. We've got um, over half of people saying that it makes them easier to use the bus. Um, uh, over half of people agree that the uh, mayor's fares makes it easier for them to get around West Yorkshire. 60% um, uh, agreeing that makes them makes it easier for them to make multiple journeys on the on the same day, um, and a good percentage of people who are um, uh, would recommend using the bus because of the fare cap. Finally, last point is this this research that we've done here sits alongside a wider suite of research. DFT are doing their own research. Transport Focus have done two two waves of survey work. We have our own annual public perceptions of transport um, survey too, which asks about confidence buying the best value ticket that I shared with you um, last year. I intend to do the same again this year. And finally, we are commissioning a wider piece of work on fares and ticketing in general, where we will revisit some of these questions so we can see the change through time. Happy to answer any questions if there are any. That's okay. Uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll pick up on the remainder of the, there's only a little bit more to go around the bus side and then we'll get on to the, the operators and, and, and questions. So, so linked to what Andrew's just said, obviously um, some very positive feedback around mayor's fares and the perception of mayor's fares and the use, the use of, um, of bus as a result of that. In the, in the report here, 
the key the key thing for me is that the the mayor's fares was originally set up and it was due to have inflationary impacts uh, built into the cost increases which were to come in at the end of year one uh, we did hold or the fares were held in september mainly on account of the fact that the government then introduced a national two pound fare scheme and we it was our intention and it, and it remains our intention to remain in line with the national fare of two pound as the government has set in that scheme which we are not part of Mayor's fares has been paid out of the BSIF, as we've referenced already. So, as a result of not being able to increase the fares, there were some unexpected pressures that came in uh, in terms of mayor's fares. And as a result of that, we will be uh, moving to increase the uh, £4.50 fare to £5 from the beginning of March. Now, this brings us in line with Manchester and is still lower than the, the Liverpool fare that they have operating at the moment as well. And overall, when we look at the fares increase on mayor's fares and the other ones, which I'll just talk about in a minute, the overall increase in the average fare across the whole network to bus passengers, because we're holding the £2 fare, is in the order of 2 to 3%. So it, it's much lower than and many people might have expected in, in, this, in this period of cost of living crisis. There are some other fares increases that have been brought in uh, through the West Yorkshire Ticketing Company Limited, uh, which is a separate entity to, to the West Yorkshire Combined Authority. This is to deal with uh, a range of a range of products where fares have been held over time. Uh, so, for instance, the under-19 fares have been frozen for about the last three years now. So there is a level of catch-up that has been required in terms of placing those products within the overall framework of what our pricing is across tickets. Um, they're, the, they're the key elements that I wanted to bring about here. Uh, it is key to remember that this is uh, a long-term programme we've got around mayor's fares. We need to be using the BSIP, uh, some of the BSIP money that governments are giving us for 24-25 uh, to effectively uh, assist in contributing to longevity of mayor's fares as a result of us holding, holding the fares as low as we possibly can over this period of time. Thank you very much for that. And obviously, uh, mayor's fares have had a great impact uh, on that £2 fare, hasn't it, over time? And uh, often we get asked, oh, it's great that the government has extended this, but actually, because the mayor was first in the country for putting £2 mayor's fares in, uh, then it is actually BSIP money that pays for that rather than national government. Uh, but great that, that can continue, not just for the passenger uplift, but of course for the cost of living crisis, because people are really still struggling. Uh, and therefore, it is great that they can travel for less and get connected to work and leisure opportunities for less. Um, Councillor Carla, did you want to come in first of all on that? No, uh, no I'm fine. No, okay. I think obviously that comes into the next report anyway around the the mayor's fares bit and, and keeping that going, but that's guaranteed now till March 2025. Um, what we have been trying to get some clarification on is is what might happen with the government scheme around the national um, fares because we don't know whether at some point that was originally supposed to go up to £2.50 at some point. We haven't had any answer on that. So I think it will be clear to get that answer to see then what other areas decide to do um, with those funds. Thank you very much. So um, questions on buses, I think. Obviously, the passenger experience uh, is something that we all hear a lot from for our constituents. And we have the bus <coughs> operators with us today. Thank you very much for coming here today. Uh, has anybody got any questions for our colleagues? Councillor Hutchinson. Thank you, Chair. And can I pass on my, the apologies of Councillor Patient, who's had to leave to deal with an incident at, uh, at school. Um, as we've seen, the figures for reliability and punctuality are, are going in the wrong direction, in the one, certainly the ones that have been presented to us. And we have heard from the report that's just been given that that does play a role in people deciding not to use the bus bus services any more than they than they absolutely have to and against that it's disappointing to see with the new the recently announced changes to timetables further cuts to the frequency of services on the core network in Calderdale, from Halifax to Bradford, going down in the evening, going down from hourly to two hourly, from Halifax to Leeds, going down from half hourly to hourly, from Halifax to Hebden Bridge, going down from half hourly to hourly. And when that's combined with poor reliability, if your <coughs> hourly bus service is cancelled, then you, it means there's two hours to have to wait. And it's even worse, obviously, if it's too early. So I really am very disappointed that those such severe cuts to frequency 
are still having to be applied on what is being determined as our core network. So um, is that a question to first bus, is it? It's first bus, yes. And an, uh, I'm not sure if you know for that particular service, go obviously from Halifax, Calderdale point of view. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. I, I think there's a there's a few points here that I'd like to um, like to pick up. I mean, first of all, um, ourselves and, and I'm sure like other operators um, constantly work really closely with both the local authority and the combined authority to improve reliability and punctuality. And actually, I fully accept there's much more work for us to do. But when we look at that trend, particularly when we look at the period up to Christmas last year there's been significant improvements uh, in reliability and punctuality. Now, some of that is driven by the fact that um, we've worked very hard to retain and recruit staff, um, whether that be through salary, through um, terms and conditions. Uh, we are starting a driver apprenticeship scheme uh, next week, which we'll be launching during uh, apprenticeship week. Uh, we've also signed up to Real Living Wage from April, so there's a lot of work going on in terms of our staffing position, and that is um, showing in terms of the statistics and the data that there is some improvement there, certainly compared to last year. Punctuality-wise, uh, which is more affected by things like traffic congestion, we are making regular adjustments to timetables. Now, I do appreciate in some cases where that demand um, and that capacity is required, we are putting extra resources in, and certainly the changes that we introduced last December is certainly showing some strong punctuality improvements. Uh, on the other side of that, we have to react to traffic conditions. And just taking Bradford as an example, uh, we put eight extra buses into that network uh, just in the last few months to be able to manage and maintain that service network. So there is resource going into the network where that capacity and demand allows. I appreciate where those corridors our, uh, the demand is less. We have to make adjustments and optimise our network to where the where the resources and where the demand is needed. So um, we, we do recognise that some of those changes are necessary, but where we can see growth, we are putting that growth in. And we are, as an operator, very much focused on, on a growth network now, but also a reliable network. And those timetable changes that we are uh, have announced recently are and putting more changes in in February is very much about being data-led, so trying to improve that punctual and reliability so that our timetables match the conditions on the road. So um, I can go away and look at some of those specific details and look at some of our plans ahead, councillor, in terms of specific corridors, but this is a very much a data-led approach that is putting resources back into the network where we can see growth and demand, but also trying to put in place a timetable that's reliable for the customer. Thank you very much, um, Councillor Hutchinson. Uh, I've got Andrew McInnes, would like to come back in? Uh, thank you, Chair. I can't answer two specifics because I represent the operators collectively. I'm not an operator uh, myself, but in terms of uh, generally, of course, operators have no direct control over the highway uh, network. Clearly, that's down to local authority. So there's three main areas which, uh, which can disrupt and can affect reliability and punctuality. Uh, one is there's a large number of major schemes um, across West Yorkshire generally, and again, that's a positive thing. That's both road schemes and, and good for economic impact for West Yorkshire, that's positive. Um, of course, you don't make an omelet without breaking an egg, unfortunately, that can bring disruption. Um, there's congestion at peak times, uh, which I'm sure we'll all be aware of. Um, but also live disruption, so things like roadworks, um, things like you know, disruptions, and there is places where uh, the strategic road network can also impact on, uh, on, on the local network. Um, so there is challenges there. There is areas where we can be better, and for example, live issues such as um, the coordination of roadworks is, uh, is one of them. And I believe local authority colleagues have something share the frustrations uh, from uh, on, uh, on statutory undertakers um, uh, and sometimes uh, roadworks can be badly coordinated. There's an interesting stat I've seen in Manchester. Unfortunately, I don't have the specific stat for West Yorkshire yet, but I'll, I'll take an action to obtain that. Um, but we had a stat on uh, an average journey times in Greater Manchester 
uh, which our chief executive articulated at a conference in Manchester last year. And that was the decline of average bus journey speeds over the last 30 years. Um, uh, and what that means is the slower buses are then clearly um, bus operators are then having to adapt to that environment. Uh, Brandon said eight vehicles in, in Bradford and talking to operators on the way, and I think a conservative number post-COVID would be 20 vehicles um, uh, across West Yorkshire to deal purely with traffic and live conditions. And that obviously affects the economic um, performance of services because you don't ultimately have automatically another 20 sorry, and passengers um, proportionate to another 20 vehicles in there. If anything, um, as you're saying, Councillor, if there's reliability challenges, if anything, you're losing customers. So I would always consistently issue the challenge that we need to do more collectively on the highway network. I do appreciate we have a finite um, road space. We can't just build roads. We don't have flying buses, unfortunately. But I'd always challenge what we can do uh, more and I think we would always value uh, your challenge to your authorities. I think we'd always value your partnership work on, uh, on whatever's possible there. But bus operators have to operate the live challenges of the, the highway network, which I think is probably one of the biggest challenges, I would say. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, obviously, we can always improve, can't we, on coordination? But I think we all have to recognise that we're always going to have roadworks. You know, Yorkshire Water might have a burst main. Northern gas networks might need to get back to a pipe that's not performing. So that's always going to happen. So we're always going to have roadworks. Um, and that is just part of day-to-day -day business and making sure we manage those as effectively as possible. Um, Councillor Edwards, you had a question. Thank you, Chair. Um, and um, I would welcome some of the data about the Mayor's fares and the impact. Um, and one of the points that I saw was that um, giving an example, the number 60, um, there was an increase in services and there was also an increase in um, patronage, which I think demonstrates that if you put the services on and if they run on time, people will use them, but we need those services. Um, however, I wanted to um, pick up on the point about ghost buses, so to, which is a big issue in the area that I represent and it's an issue in many um, wards, especially outside of the city centres, um, and it's still happening. Um, and it was talking about the bus, the report talked about bus operators not reporting these in a timely manner. So I'd like to ask each of the operators here today, will you commit to any cancellations being reported immediately? As soon as people in the depot know that that cancellation is, is happening, it needs to be reported immediately. And if it's not reported, whichever member of staff it is whose job it is to do that, there need to be consequences. Because in areas like mine and um, other areas, um, that can be very serious for people if, if they don't know whether the bus is coming. And, and that is on you, and that is something that you can do. So can we have that commitment around ghost buses? Um, also, in terms of accountability, Andrew, you talked about partnership work, and I agree, that's what we would all want. However, for that to work, we need to know that we're getting data from the bus companies, and we also need to have that partnership. Um, I'm pleased to see that TransDev are here today, um, because in all the time that I've been on this committee, it's the first time um, we've had you here. It's good to see two of you in fact, um, however, my ward um, has three services, the A1, the A2, the A3. These provide a crucial connection between Bradford and Leeds to the airport, but they're essential for people who are working in the area. They're essential to visitors. Um, I've contacted TransDev on a number of occasions through different means, and I've never received a response to any of my emails, any of my attempts. Can I put it to you that that is not a spirit of partnership. That's not a good spirit of good partnership work. And it's completely unacceptable um, when, as a company, you are receiving significant amounts of public subsidy. Um, so I would like a commitment to better partnership work um, from TransDev, and particularly around some of the airport services, um, including the A1, where there have been a number of cuts or changes. Um, and first, as well, um, 
I, I have had contact with first and uh, Brandon, I, I know we've met before and um, your colleague, um, Kaylee, and that's welcome. However, when we've asked for bus performance data, we've uh, either been told that it will be provided, but several months later, we're still waiting for that. Um, or we've been told that it can't be shared because of commercial sensitivity. Commercial sensitivity on routes where there is only one bus, which is most, it, which is quite a lot of my ward and other out, outer areas. What commercial sensitivity is it if there is no competition on that route and there's not likely to be any competition anytime soon? So can we have, can we have a commitment from first to share that bus performance data with us as elected members in a prompt and timely manner? I'm, I'm talking um, a matter a week or a matter of weeks, not months, because again, we can't, we are here to represent our communities and it's simply unacceptable to be waiting and waiting and waiting and for this information not to be provided. So um, ghost buses and bus performance accountability. Thank you. So Andrew, would you like to, uh, on the ghost buses, is that something you can uh, respond to and then go to the Transdev and first bus to uh, address? I was going to say, not to me directly, I think that would be one for the operators to answer more specifically. Okay, well, we'll go to Transdev. Transdev, do you have to? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Council Edwards. Um, and yeah, in terms of attendance here, um, yeah, we, we've walked to, to make up for the past, I assume. But actually, this is the first time um, in five years, of, well, actually more, probably nearly 10 years of working in West Yorkshire that I've been invited to the, to the Transport Committee. So it's very nice to, um, to be here and have this opportunity to, to engage. Um, in terms of ghost buses, um, I think we do um, pretty well at getting our cancellations up to date on the web. Um, unfortunately, there will always be instances in a, um, a high pressure situation where you pretty well break down on the road um, that that uh, notification may take a, uh, a little while to filter through. Uh, and we, we certainly aren't perfect at doing it, uh, but rest assured, we. Uh, we do keep on top of that and ensure that we are getting the processes right behind it. Uh, we've also got a couple of system changes coming up with a um, that will tie in the the feed um, for cancellations through into all downstream systems. At the moment, we have to cancel it. Would you believe three different times in three different systems because the systems don't always talk to each other? But thankfully, that will be resolved by April. Um, when we get an upgrade to the system to do that and therefore just cancelling it once in our back office will remove the risk of an error coming into there so yes that, that should resolve that um, in terms of communication um, first of all sorry if we, we haven't got back to you um, um, I do personally think I've had a correspondence with you so I'll, I'll drop you a line after this meeting uh, and perhaps if you could share some of the correspondence you've had then I can investigate on your behalf oh, but uh, well that will correspondence you have said you have sent sorry but I can at least trace what's happened to that and make sure you've got the uh, the, the right conversation I know from my regular conversations with Councillor Carlisle as well that um, there's been a couple of instances where things have been fed back to him that's not Councillor colleagues haven't had a response from so um, yeah let us uh, investigate that for you because that's not something we would normally uh, normally do on there and yet more than happy to have a discussion with you about the uh, the A1, A2 and A3 um, going forward. Hopefully that covered everything you asked of us. <laughs> I suspect you by your face you maybe not so if you can remind me of anything else I need to comment. On. Um, so specifically specifically about accountability and who we contact at, at Transdev can you clarify for all of us because I know there are a number of members around here whose wards are served by Transdev Services. Who do we contact and can that information be shared with us and also with our um, constituents as well? Um, because at the moment, um, people send in a comment, members of the public send in a comment, it goes into this vast black hole, this customer service black hole and nobody knows what happens next. So can we have some specific um, addresses or some specific contact details for members of the public and also for us as elected members. Uh, yeah, I can provide that through the uh, 
through Wicca so we can get that circulated to all members um, rather than the expense of all to write it down now. That's no problem. Uh, more than happy to update you all on that. Thank you. It sounds to be like you need to have a look at customer service and how that's working behind the scenes. There's obviously something not, not quite working there. Um, first for us, Brandon. <coughs> Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Councillor, for the questions. Um, if I could just very briefly pick up on the ghost bus issue. Um, um, I think my first point is, as you see in the papers, there's a working group uh, established through the Combined Authority now, and actually um, that is a really good platform to share you know, where we are. There are some challenges around data, data flow, around some technology, around some systems. But I can assure you, um, as an operator working with the combined authority, it is a focus for us. We are um, very aware of those, of those issues that occur for customers. Um, the vast majority of the time, it works well. There are times when it doesn't work well, which is really inconvenient and causes a lot of challenges for our customers. We understand that. And there are four key areas we're, we're working on, really. One of them is around software and the way uh, that, that our um, systems analyze that data and how they then turn that into outputs for customers. And there are some changes that we've made uh, at the end of last year, which is starting to see some improvements. It's not just one solution. The second, as you point out, is around how our staff manually intervene and make those cancellations occur. And you're right, there have been occasions for various reasons when we've not been as good as we could have been in doing that. We've put a lot of uh, work in terms of both training and resource to, to improve that process. There are still times of the day and days of the week when there are um, a significant amount of issues that are occurring on a network that, that mean it's quite difficult to prioritize that when there are some, some other priorities, but we need to manage that more effectively and as effectively as we can. But there has been a lot of work going into that and we are starting to see improvements on the ground. One of the things we're trialling uh, in another location, actually, but across our UK bus network, is something called automatic cancellation. So the manual intervention is, is required less, but our, our systems can automatically process that through to give our customers a better uh, solution. So as that trial um, follows on, we'll be able to see if we can replicate that um, across our networks. Uh, and the last one is, um, is just uh, uh, the network technology. So updating our ticket machines with, with uh, 4G technology rather than some of the 3G technology that have been currently used on there. So there's quite a lot of work going on and it, it is improving, but that, as you right, rightly say, there's a, a continued focus <coughs> from the operator side to make sure that there's sufficient resource to do that manual intervention, and that is happening. Um, in terms of um, data, um, we... We do provide a lot of data through the combined authority already, and, and we have had conversations around opening that up, particularly around where the congestion hotspots are around our network so that we can work closely with the authorities to, to target interventions. I think as a general principle, um, we are keen to share that data. Um, I need to have a look at what the specifics were that you asked about uh, to be able to then share that, because clearly, if you're asking it, uh, in, to, in respect of one ward, then I think we need to look at how we would share you know, certain amounts of data more across the network, and perhaps that's a conversation we need to have with the combined authority about how we do that. But, but in principle, um, we want to share data because we, we want to share performance with, with customers and with stakeholders so that we can share where the challenges are as well as where the, the, the benefits are. Thank you very much. It should have been Councillor Carlin at this point, just about the ghost bus thing. And I, I think there's, there's something wider here about uh, customer experience and the passenger charter, isn't it, we were talking about just then? That um, I, I've had this again and again that people don't get their emails responded to. Um, and I, I do think there's something for us to look at there. Because if we're not, if the services from the operators are not responding, then how do we ever learn as a whole system? Uh, and therefore, I, I would like us to look at that, perhaps uh, do something about the passenger charter and see how it operators and uh, perform against that at the next meeting. I think that's perhaps something to do. But Councillor Carl, you wanted to come in on the ghost bus? Uh, yeah, I can do, because obviously we've reported, I think, at the last few of the transport committees around this working group that's been set up. Um, and that's looked at a number of the issues around ghost buses. Um, I think at first it wasn't clear, in fact, where all of the 
the issues were coming up and where the most significant problem was. There's been a few data problems that have been put right. There's been a few um, different changes in process. But I think as it shows in this report that the main one we're seeing is, is buses not being effectively cancelled um, so that it still shows on the screen. Uh, and that is a requirement on operators. I know that in most cases that needs to be done manually and that's a problem, but operators have got a position in to, to do that. But we've seen huge fluctuations at times, I think, in the processes that operators have and then the number that are cancelled to the point where it, there's no static figure. And, and that shows you that some periods of time, maybe when everything's going smoothly, then everything is cancelled as it should be because there's enough time in the, depot to do, in the depot to do that. At times when the network is hit hard by reliability problems, perhaps, then things aren't being cancelled as they should, perhaps because Quite rightly, the staff in the depot have a lot of other things to do to make sure they're dealing with the problems of not having enough drivers or, or you know, what bus is going out. But unfortunately, at that, the one thing that does seem to miss off at that point is cancelling that bus on the system if it's not going to be run as soon as we know. And that's why sometimes, unfortunately, that somebody is waiting for a bus that, that somebody knew wasn't coming. Um, in terms of the part about passenger experience, I wonder if Mick's able to just remind us a bit of the detail of what's in there, because that's something that came to this committee very recently, isn't it, to sign off, um, just in terms of the responses? Thanks, Councillor Carlo. Yes, I, uh, I think my recollection is that the passenger charter was launched in March 2023 through this committee, and one of the key elements of that was about customer complaints and passenger feedback mechanism, and the difficulty we had at the time in, in centralising that, and, and, and perhaps is reason for some of the comments that have been made today about about that and I've just been on to the colleague who leads on that piece of work um, and we've asked that that, that in addition um, to the report to, to the charter when it's relaunched in April 2024 on its um, on its on first anniversary will be a list of KPIs that show performance but also to revisit the customer feedback mechanism to see if that's working what the effective effectiveness is and look at the data through that and to work with operators to bring a, a, a refreshed passenger charter to be launched early this year. But in that response to your comments, Chair, we can get something in the next Transport Committee that give you a, 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 an interim update on that position. Yeah. Thank you. I also don't want to wait till April to make improvements. So if things aren't working, let, let's sort it now. Any more questions or comments on the bus operators or do we move on to rail? I'm not seeing any hands indicating at the moment. So if we move on to the rail element then, um, is that you again, Dave? That's me again. I'll, again, I'll, t I'll talk through briefly, mindful of time here. Um, in terms of the uh, rail side of things, um, as opposed to bus where we do tend to relate the passenger levels back to pre-pandemic levels, rail, rail uh, companies Northern Transparent have now moved to a year-on-year -year reporting just to be, just be mindful of that. So Northern's uh, relating to an 8% increase, November to November, um, commuter levels remaining stable, but leisure is an important market. And TPE's got 33% increase compared to that time, um, but actually there were, you know, a, a high level of, uh, exceptionally high level of cancellation during that period and demand at this time, that, that went at, the, at, at the previous time that, that year. Um, I won't go much into too much detail around that, but if you look at the rail network service changes, I think you'll recall um, we had a number of discussions at the last Transport Committee about the new winter timetable coming in on the 10th of December. There were some uh, concerns and issues around, or concerns, should I say, around the, the impacts that would have uh, northern trains with some uh, reduction in the lengthening of trains on a couple of lines there. And also uh, with TransPennine, with the introduction of the Nova 3, and again, my understanding is that uh, the rail operators here today have, have some updates on some of those issues, uh, which they'll be able to give us if we, if we so wish to uh, in the meeting as well. In terms of uh, network performance and reliability, I think it's fair to say there have been some, some big challenges in this area, notwithstanding the fact that the operators may wish to update on, on the figures we've got here. There's been a significant decline in punctuality from both Northern and TPE. And uh, cancellations from Northern have increased, and, and TPEs have also increased, but not to the high levels they were previously experiencing. So there's, there's some areas of concern there around performance, I think it's fair to say, overall. Of course, there has been some um, issues within that around availability of rest day working and the weather and network rail attributes, for instance. So rail, rail performance isn't necessarily just solely a function of the rail operators. Network rail do, do come into this equation at all. It has to be remembered. Um, I touched on the TPE and the rest day working. Um, I'll, 
I'll pick up very briefly on a couple of other aspects. Uh, rail strikes, there's a brief, a brief bit of text in here on rail strikes. Um, as you know, we're in a period of, of rail, rail strikes at the moment between 29th of January, which is today, up to the 6th of February. Um, there's uh, expected to be some additional disruption on lines due to the Aslov overtime ban. Uh, specifically, uh, this Wednesday, 31st of January, um, there, there's a rail strike where there'll be, no, there'll be no or very limited services in here. I think no services actually is, is the case to mention. There's a section here around um, upgrades on Transpennine, uh, activity on Transpennine route upgrade. Uh, we have some active groups that work on this and work closely to make sure that this information is communicated clearly to members because there's going to be a significant uh, disruption coming up over, over quite a substantial period of time which we shouldn't lose sight of. Uh, the final couple of things to mention, I think um, Councillor Hutchinson quite rightly mentioned before around the closure of rail ticket offices and the consultation that took place around that. Uh, we have been in discussion with the, the rail operators around um, what measures they're taking to fill the posts, because uh, of course there were some re recruitment freezes in place at the point at which the consultation was ongoing. And again, we have the operators in the room who, who may wish to, wish to comment on that. And finally, uh, although sort of not in our patch, uh, we have been informed by Northern that there's an introduction of charges for car parking at a number of stations around the country. I think there's about nine stations outside of West Yorkshire. But be mindful that two of those stations are those which border onto us at Wheaton and Connolly. So we, we are expecting to work closely with Northern to understand the impacts of, of those charging, um, charging measures that have been putting in, including where it may have an impact on our own, our own uh, level of... Um, patronage of rail heading going into, into West Yorkshire from outside West Yorkshire as well. So I'll, I'll leave it at that for now and uh, for the operator to ask any questions or to ask any questions of the operator. Thank say. you very much. That's much better uh, way of presenting it. Um, so um, I think two things, um, big things, is obviously the strikes this week as well. So how can you say how you're operating this week and how you're alleviating any pressures on members of the travelling public? Um, and then also... Uh, Councillor Hutchinson's point from earlier uh, about the ticket offices uh, and whether you know you're now fully staffed in the ticket offices because obviously after you held back vacancies and after the government decided not to close the ticket offices uh, then there were we did find there was early closure of ticket offices or unexpected closure of the ticket offices across West Yorkshire because you just didn't have the stretch in the staff uh, and obviously want to eliminate that now so some indication on those two items um, I don't know who wants to go first, and, uh, Northern or Transpennine. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think just to address the ticket office situation, um, you're absolutely right, Councillor, that the, um, the promise was made for us to start recruiting to fill those vacancies. That recruitment has started. What we're having to do, what you need to be mindful of, is, is do it in a bit of a phased approach because we've got so many um, vacancies that, that needed that backfill, so we're prioritising um, the, the areas that have been hit the, the hardest, where we haven't got as much cross cover um, to allow our training departments <coughs> the, the ability to be able to get that training up and running. So those are being um, actively advertised and, um, and interviewed for as we speak, and there'll be more and more coming through as the weeks progress to, to make sure that we fill all those vacancies. So that's from, from Northern, that's our commitment um, that we'll be doing it. So there'll be, um, we'll be following the commitment to keep ticket offices open for the hours that they were, they were scheduled to be open for. You know, when you be finished with that recruitment phrase, obviously... Well, it's going to take long? place over the next few months so that we can get them through the training because our training team is only a finite resource. So we need to, but we've got those training courses planned in now over the next few months and we'll be just filling those as we go through uh, based on, on whatever, you know, whether it's ticket office specific or whether it's ticket office and dispatch is slightly different sort of training requirements. But we've got plans to have all those courses filled and, um, and we'll be doing that over the next few months. But we have got cross cover in other places. So we've seen a significant improvement already in the ticket office opening, um, being able to to cross cover that as well so there has been some improvement in that I think it just shows doesn't it even even mooting the point that ticket offices might close has caused a massive disruption across the network actually uh, for the travelling public so um, I'd like government to be careful about how they 
go about making announcements and uh, putting pressure on operators uh, to uh, you know, trim their budgets because it does have long-term consequences. Uh, and regarding the um, strikes, uh, Kerry, did you want to come back on that? Yeah, so strikes take place on the 31st of January, so there'll be no Northern Services running on Wednesday this week. Um, there's action short of strike action, which is a rest day ban for the full week, which started yesterday and runs to the 6th of February. Um, so we do expect to see more challenges um, with being able to cover all our services. So, for instance, this morning, South East Yorkshire had about 20 services uncovered at the start of day. That's, that's pretty much half now. Um, but it is something that could fluctuate as the week goes on. So we do expect to see a higher number of um, cancellations this week. But we're trying to mitigate that where we can. It's that there's no flexibility um, for drivers to be able to move their hours either as part of um, the action short of strike action. So it does limit us to, to what we can do in some scenarios. Thanks very much. So thank you for the opportunity to give a quick give a quick update. So I think there's a couple of areas that have been asked about there. So we'll cover the strike uh, first. So we, we won't be running any any services during the main main part of, main part of the day. The, uh, the, fo the focus is really on making sure that we get the, the shutdown and the startup right, so we're presenting the least amount of, least amount of disruption uh, to customers travelling on the uh, on the days either, days either side. Um, I think, as we talked about previously at the com at the committee, there's um, the action short of a strike weeks have been particularly challenging for TP in the in in the past. So what we're seeing at the moment is that with the timetable interventions that we made back in back in December. We are looking at a much improved level of level of resilience there, so we're expecting that there will still be around um, around 20 or so cancel cancellations happening each each day uh, to cover for the fact that we still have that training backlog, which we're working really hard to clear clear at the clear at the moment. Um, but we will be in a much much better position to where we were in the uh, in November when I think the last the last strike action took 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 place. Um, and then in terms of the ticket offices. Uh, enclosure so like northern we've been working working hard in the background to recruit recruit up and start staffing the ticket offices uh, to the uh, to the hours so that's that's all all going rel going relatively well but we've still got a, still got a few areas that we'll need to close out in the next uh, the next next couple of months but you should be seeing a much improved uh, opening hours from us so thanks I, I suppose from um, our point of view as well I just want some reassurance that you know, you are absolutely willing to talk to the trade unions and there's no reluctance on your part to come to the table. Obviously, it's in everybody's interest to get to a, a good resolution as quick as possible. Yeah, no, abs 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 absolutely. So we're, 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 we're standing by to have those, have those, dis have those discussions. There's clearly a, a national aspect to it, which we need to be, which we need to be mind, mind, mindful of. But we're, we're, we're absolutely ready to, ready to engage when there's a, when there's a, ra when there's a mandate there to engage around. So thank you. Um, any more comments or questions? Councillor Hutchison, Cashel first. Thank you, Chair. I would like to understand a bit more about Northern's stations as a place um, policies. Uh, obviously, manned ticket offices and the other services that can be supply provided from them is part of that. But also, more widely, um, you know, I believe that Northern had decided at a fairly short notice to uh, uh, introduce licensing fees for car clubs to use the station, uh, the station car parks, um, which it's obviously has an impact on the on the hope to uh, in increase or reduce the dependency on private vehicles. And how that fits in with the wider car parking charging strategy, which you know c could be used helpfully if it deters people from by default using private cars to actually get access to the rail network if there are other options open to them. But how it can be done as a kind of coordinated, properly thought through process. So I would like to know more about stations as a place and what we can do to promote that 
um, saga of Dave Haskin in the stage. Do you want to come on with that? Because obviously that's... I, I We've discussed this many times before, actually, and from my point of view, in that I do see station car parks like a park and ride solution, really, uh, to get um, cars off the road from that point of view. Or is it Helen? Sorry, Helen. Maybe we're just going to Helen. Thank you. I think um, we... So we, we have been looking at stations and through um, a number of pieces of our work around, particularly in the rail strategy and around how we can work, um, how we can look at kind of building more into stations through placemaking and bringing um, that kind of interconnectivity around stations. Um, there's also a piece of work we're currently doing around mobility hubs and around kind of bringing a number of other connected places um, through, through that, so looking at how we can integrate um, through car clubs and through wider kind of active travel and place making through there so um so we are kind of looking at how we can build um station kind of places if you like into wider into wider parks thank you um, council first oh thank you uh, chair uh, david in, in his presentation touched on communication and I, i'd just like um, to mention the Collect rail and the transpennine upgrade uh, because communications are excellent uh, with uh, Network Rail to inform us uh, well in advance of any blockades that are taking place uh, and, and the works that are doing. Uh, and I'll repeat it again, I've said it many times, people don't realise that this is the biggest project uh, at present happening in the, in the country, uh, Network Rail Upgrade and Transpennine. And uh, touch wood, it's all working very well at the moment and so congratulations Network Rail. Thank you, Councillor Firth. It's nice to hear that positive feedback. And it is absolutely, as you say, a huge investment uh, for the north of England and one that we've been wanting for a very long time, so it's lovely to see it being realised. Uh, Councillor Edwards. Thank you, Chair. Um, two, uh, two questions. Um, so the first one about strikes, um, which will be a concern to many people, especially those um, where there is only one operator, um, where there is only one rail operator. Um, I mean, you've, I've raised this issue before about relations between the companies and the trade unions, and I would put it to you that nobody working for the railways would take the decision lightly to um, to withhold a day's work. Um, I mean, not only is it the impact, not only is there the impact on passengers, but also it's a loss of a day's salary um, in the middle of a cost of living crisis in the middle of winter. Um, and also, in order to get to that point, there has to be a democratic ballot within the union. Um, and um, there are, we know there are significant issues with sickness, um, ongoing sickness, with vacancies, um, as well as service cuts, which can result from that. Um, so can I put it to you? Uh, and also, this has been ongoing. This is not something which has just started. So can I put it to you that relations between the train companies and the trade unions are not good enough, and you have a significant responsibility um, here to members of the public who are paying the consequences of this. Um, and so can I put the challenge to you that you must do better because, because this is having a serious impact on the travelling public and that that relationship needs to be improved. It's not good enough at the moment and it's having a serious impact. Um, so there's a question about the strikes. Also, a question related to passenger experience. Um, so I and a number of the other Leeds members on here um, received an email some time ago from a resident. This particular resident was talking about the 753 um, train from Morley to Leeds, um, which I think starts in, uh, starts in Wigan, um, and repeated cancellations. However, the points that he was making about the train from Morley could equally apply to other stations as well, um, not just in Leeds, across West Yorkshire. Um, and what he was saying is repeated cancellations meant that he was getting to work late. He was a young professional, he was getting to work late. The train was the only option for him to get into Leeds. Um, and as a result of arriving late, he was getting into trouble with his um, employers, um, who quite understandably expected him to be on time, but this is not his fault. Um, and so when there are these cancellations, there are real life consequences um, for people who need to get to work, who need to get to hospital appointments, who um, have onward transport connections. And so from a passenger's perspective, 
if a passenger is in that situation where their train is cancelled and it's not a one-off, it's a regular occurrence, what would you do? What is that person supposed to do um, in that situation that they're at the station, their train, the 753 or whatever train it is, has been cancelled? What are they supposed to do in that situation? Let's go to Northern Chad. Would you like me to come in first? Um, you're absolutely right. You know, we don't want to cancel any trains. It's as simple as that. And and performance um, before Christmas was, you know, showing high levels of cancellation. So we were at 7.4%. There are some green shoots. We we have enough train crew. Let me be clear. We have the, the right amount of train crew to be able to deliver the full service. We do, as you referred to, have continual high levels of sickness. Um, thankfully, as of the 25th of January for this last period, the cancellation rate is over halved. So we are seeing much stronger performance um, since the start of the year, which is, which is good news. Um, we continue to drive high levels of training. So we've got currently in the East region alone 2,660 outstanding training days. But with the help of us having the rest day work agreement, we've been able to get through just for the East region over 200 days a week um, through using that rest day work agreement to get that training down. So that's our absolute priority is to make sure we are getting our people through the training and qualified and out doing the jobs that we um, employ them to do and to absolutely drive those cancellation numbers <coughs> down. And I'm not familiar with any um, correspondence on the, the train that you mentioned in particular but you you're right you know people dep depend on us to get to work to get to the you know to whether it's be schools jobs funerals shopping you know it's all important to those individuals and, and we need to we do need to improve and then transfer nine yes i think i think in very, very much the same way we absolutely recognise the, the challenges our customers experience and we've got high levels of high levels of, can, of cancellation so I think the, the key thing is that we you know, we always we always try to apologise when that does when that does does happen and we do offer sort of at least some sort some forms of comp compensation uh, when that when that happens we've been working really hard as I said earlier to clear the training backlog and get ourselves in better shape we've seen some real improvements since the December timetable change so we're about 26% better in terms of in terms of cancellations than we were before that timetable. That timetable was introduced, and actually, the, a lot of the a lot of the challenges we've had, we've had have been much more much more weather 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 related and other and other infrastructure issues over the last the last month the last month or so. So I think the underlying picture for TPE is really is re is really improving. So hopefully we can we can start to uh, the customers can start to see some real uh, sustained improvement from us over the months to come. Thanks. Uh, I know Councillor Edwards would like to continue this, obviously we're short of time, but uh, can I just ask you to also note uh, seriously his comments around the trade union relations, uh, which obviously does need to improve, otherwise we won't be in this position. Um, so I think it's probably worth perhaps a, a longer response to Councillor Edwards perhaps uh, outside this meeting. Yes, I have, have you to say something briefly, if that's okay, sorry for not to answer that, answer that question. So we have been working really, really hard since the, the transfer into DOHL back in the, back in the spring. So locally, that has seen the relationship with the trade union Im imp improved to the extent that we've been able to restore uh, rest, day, rest day working, which is clearly helping uh, with our perform performance at the moment. And locally, relationships are are, are improving. Um, I think in respect of the dispute which has created the strikes this this week, as I said when I spoke earlier, there's a there's a national there's a national mandate in play in play here. So there is there is a relatively limited. Amount that we can we can do we can do locally in terms of the, the, the relationships and and so on to it to it to affect that we have to work with the national that with the, within that national mandate as it as it stands as it stands today. Thank you. Um, I want to move on now to the next paper really, unless you've got any further burning questions. No. Um, so um, I thank you very much for your attendance. I would like um, the bus operators to stay for the council. Obviously, the next one is about the bus service improvement plan, so it might be something on there that is of your interest. Um, and it might be a conversation uh, perhaps with Councillor Edwards um, before you leave rail operators just to reassure him of uh, your positive action on the uh, items that he raised. 
Um, so, bus service improvement plan. Helen. Thank you, Councillor Hinchcliffe. Um, there's a couple of things in this paper that we just wanted to work through. Um, first of all, um, there is an endorsement around the phase three funding, um, which is the new um, government funding for BSIP. So we've received, um, the paper sets out the funding we've already received um, through the BSIP programme. Um, government have proposed a further 13.3 million for 24-25. Um, we um, would like endorsement from Transport Committee of how we um, spend that funding over the current year. Um, 11 million of that to go towards Mayor's Fairs and a further 2.7 million to go on, onto network and then um, a small amount of money to go onto the enhanced safer travel. Our next stage is to um, access that funding is to update our enhanced partnership. Um, so um, with endorsement from Transport Committee, that, is, um, that would be our update to the enhanced partnership is that spending profile. So that's building on um, funding that we're already doing within that enhanced partnership. Did you want to say that first? Or not? Lovely. Thank you very much. So um, obviously uh, for members who are new to this committee, the Bus Service Improvement Plan is money that West Yorkshire uh, receive from government and then we decide in Transport Committee and obviously with the Mayor uh, about how that money is spent. About half of it is spent on the Mayor's fares and the other half is spent on service improvements. And of course, I'm afraid as money is reduced with the bus service operation uh, grants, then this has been come to be making up for more core services, which is not what his intention was. But uh, so the more money we can get for more services, the better. I think we'd all agree on that in the room. Um, has anybody got any questions or comments on this paper? I've got Councillor Hutchinson, then Councillor Hussain. Thank you, Chair. In Appendix 1, uh, in this section on risks of the, of the BSIP programme, it says, I'd just like to understand why are BSIP projects costing more than originally anticipated? Obviously, there will be the component that's due to inflation, inflation, but are there other factors that are leading to increased risk from the, co from the cost and not being able to then deliver the other... Uh, benefits that the program is intended to. Um, so the bit you're referring to is the approval that we require from this paper um, through the change request for, from the BSIP funding. So if I go if I go over that and then I can explain the risk, would that help? That would probably make it a little easier. So um, through um, this paper is also requesting an approval um, for um, a further a further a further part of the BSIP funding to support um, the super bus services and the first tranche of um, new improved improved bus services for um, through the funding. Um, the risks bit you require there is essentially setting out um, increased costs for the services that have come back um, over and above what we'd allow uh, allocated um, in the original budgets. So that's um, for so the number of services we can deliver through the BSIP that we'd originally set out may be lower than we expected and due to operators coming back with higher costs um, than we had allocated originally. Inflation is, is increasing rapidly. I think that is probably the explanation that you're asking for, Councillor Hutchinson. So, so that is the only factor. There's another one in so I think inflation is a part. There's another one in there where where it's been very difficult over a number of years to see where bus patronage is going to go. Is it going to get back to 100% or similar? I think when we've made an assumption of the costs and talking to operators early on in the BSIP programme, there's been an assumption that some of that patronage may come back. Um, we're now getting new figures that might factor in that patronage not being there. Um, so there's some services that we really wanted to do which were costed as, as a small contribution, I guess, from the combined authority. But when we've gone back to operators, they've said really that they think the patronage uh, is, is going to be lower than they thought, so they would like more contribution from the combined authority than previous. So I think that's a, a part of play as well. Yeah. But if those gloomy predictions from the operators don't play out and we find patronage increases, is there some flexibility then to actually... Uh, regain or rebalance it towards the original assumptions. Yeah, so we have we have a budget um, for the network part of BSIP. Um, as we work, kind of work through and understand where we are with each of those services, we can therefore understand how many more services or lengths of contracts we can award through that process. 
obviously we all are better off if more people use the bus, aren't we, for all sorts of reasons. Uh, Councillor Hussain. Thank you, Chair. Chair, can me and Councillor Caroline Firth just thank the committee for, um, uh, on behalf of Keithy residents who have benefited from the Mayor's Fairs, those deprived communities that we represent, uh, it's very, very important that uh, when we're speaking up on the ground, uh, that they mention that they've benefited through this uh, uh, COVID crisis and, you know, the cost of living crisis uh, with the Mayor's Fairs. Just my question is on the allocated budget on the Keithy Towns Network. Uh, it says, yes, one and a half million. Do we have a figure that we have left over and how much is going to be spent next year on the Keaty Towns Network? Thank you. Thank you. I mean, it has been tremendous, hasn't it, really? Just the, the Superbus investment has shown really good results in terms of 21% increase in people using the bus, which is great. Yeah. And I think the Superbus in Leeds as well. And obviously, we've got some more... Uh, approvals we've done here on the Halifax Huddersfield which I hope therefore will show similar results so the investments we are making on these additional services is really positive and it's nice to see that um, so Helen did you want to come back on that yeah and I think that's where we can show that we've kind of when we've done some investment we can we've got the output from that um, I think the final thing here was um, just to have the recommendation that the 3.168 um, 3 million further is released from the programme um, to deliver the further uh, super bus services and the additional um, transform services. Can I just note one change for those that's in the paper? Um, the service 212 is listed um, and that one won't be coming forward as part of this, this tranche of services. It'll be coming forward in the later tranche of services and that's due to costs and timing of that funding coming back. And I think in answer to Councillor Hussain's uh, question, is it, is it not, it's a three-year programme, isn't it, a funding for the Keatley programme, and I, I think it may be tapered, uh, but after three years, then it has to, oh, Transdev will know, because Transdev will run the service. So we like the Keatley bus service, Trans, that's a bit of positive news for you, we like the Keatley service. Do you I want don't to say anything else then after that, surely, I'll that's, 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 that's just keep quiet, but, but no, thank you for that. I, I think, um, yes, it, it's a three-year uh, agreement, and the funding... Uh, tapers after that and then there's a, a potential two-year extension on that um, and I think the, the the interesting thing we're really keen to get Keithley early on in this because actually uh, quite a lot of communities in Keithley didn't didn't really see much benefit from mayor's fares because the maximum fare on a lot of the town services was two pounds which is why we thought actually going for the one pound town fare there would be something that would have some good impact and actually on the routes that only benefit from that, we've got 5% growth um, in the first few months. Uh, the two routes we've increased in frequency uh, are already up to 20% in there. Uh, and also, um, in response to Councillor Hutchinson's point of view, with, with the, the 60 into Leeds, um, I think we've quoted 28% in, in, in that. Um, and that's actually perhaps slightly underselling it because that refers to the route as a whole, whereas at the moment, the benefit is primarily between Shipley and Leeds, but actually coming out of Leeds, we're up to 40% um, growth compared to where we were before, um, which has created a, one or two capacity problems. Um, despite us putting on 15% extra resource, we have got some quite busy journeys, which is excellent. So in response to that, we'll be adding in some extra capacity mm -hmm. and we'll be extending the, the, the current new trips that only run to Shipley through to Keithley for, for May Court, and we'll be doing that um, within the funding envelope that's already there. So, because, so in response to your point, because it is doing better than we expected, that gives us a framework to do more, and hopefully that creates this sort of cycle of benefit, doesn't it, in there, and allows us confidence to uh, to invest in more, um, and hopefully it's say um, the effects will be witnessed similarly elsewhere as well in the short in due course. Lovely, that's, uh, that's great to hear uh, and good to hear. That is exactly what this committee wants to see, of course. We invest in trial routes, see if they work uh, in partnership with yourselves and then it increases patronage and gets vehicles off the road and leads to more profitable routes and that, that is essentially what we're all about here. So this money is giving us an opportunity to do that. I'm really glad we're using it to the best advantage. Any more questions or comments on this? We'll move straight to approvals. Okay, well, I'm happy to recommend approvals. Councillor Carlo, can you second those? Yeah, happy to second it, yeah. All those in favour, please show. So thank you, that is carried. So moving on now then to um, item rail strategy update. If we can do that briefly, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hinchcliffe. Um, so just a brief...
brief report here. So this, uh, the rail strategy went out to consultation in the summer last year. Um, this um, looked at the full coverage of the rail strategy and um, set out to adopt um, this year. And we are working towards an adoption at the combined authority meeting in March on the 14th. Um, what we would like Transport Committee to do here today is to note um, the outcomes of that consultation and how it is taken forward. Um, it should be noted that the rail strategy will be adopted to our current transport strategy. Um, it will then be transferred over to our new local transport plan um, when we hopefully move that towards adoption um, later next year. Um, the main changes in the rail strategy um, following consultation, which was an overall positive consultation, um, were really to just update around the um, rail, uh, rolling stock and decarbonisation to just strengthen kind of some of the content um, around there. Um, the other update uh, was really the timing of the rail strategy being consulted on and Network North happening um, in October. Um, we reflected on the consultation for the rail strategy and what Network North was saying and um, we essentially used um, Network North as a hook to sort of set out our kind of still keen for some long uh, long distance connectivity and increased service operations so so within that um, we set out um, where we wanted to kind of make sure we were promoting um, West Yorkshire through Network North um, and um, including some key key areas within that that weren't promoted through Network North particularly around the T-shaped station for Leeds improved connectivity in West and South Yorkshire and East and West Midlands and electrification of the Calder Valley um, and the Harrogate line um, and um, flagging the Penistone line through that as well. So, um, so we, what we want Transport Committee to do here is um, endorse um, the rail strategy and um, endorse it moving towards adoption um, in March. Thank you. And of course, we've seen this as we've gone, uh, gone along in its development, hasn't it? So it shouldn't become a surprise to anybody. Has anybody got any questions or comments on this? Obviously, we've got to recommend it today. I've got Councillor Hutchinson, Councillor McLaughlin, Councillor Edwards. Thank you, Chair. Um, as you said, it's good to see that the Calder Valley line electrification is flagged up, and that would, you know, the, this should be a very, very strong business case for that, but it didn't appear in the Network North. Um, Program. So I would like us to make sure that that does get emphasised strongly to uh, to the government. But also the um, Castlefields corridor, which would be essential to link the services on the Calder Valley line with the universities, hospitals and Manchester Airport. Um, and it's how, you, how the West Yorkshire Rail strategy actually references scheme projects that would be needed to happen outside the borders of West Yorkshire and I'm not entirely clear of that. Hmm. Yeah thank you so our rail strategy focuses on what we want from West Yorkshire and what we want from the rail network within West Yorkshire um, but through that process but also through the um, LTP process we will be working with our neighbouring authorities um, to kind of promote and work to kind of jointly promote um, the kind of other schemes that would help benefit West Yorkshire. Uh, Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'd uh, like to welcome the, the results of the consultation that we seem to reveal a consensus around uh, opinion in and around the industry and the public sector and the private sector as well, that more integration with the rest of the public sector, the public um, transport network and active travel, decarbonisation being an absolutely key part of the core of any of our strategies and uh, improving stations and accessibility, which I know is a key priority. Um, I also welcome mention of connectivity between West and South Yorkshire being one of our priorities as a combined authority and thank you for mentioning the Penniston line. I, was, I am going to bring up the Penniston line because I know it's a priority for Kirklees Council um, and it is a massively underutilised resource connecting those two parts of the country. Um, so I noticed it was conspicuous by its absence in this report so I just wanted to bring it up here. Don't forget about the Penniston line. Fine. And Councillor Edward. Thank you Chair. <coughs> And as um, my colleagues have said, there are many positive points um, in this report. Um, I wanted to pick up on um, one of the points here, the importance of improving stations, particularly around accessibility. Um, I mean, one of the things that came up, um, one of the messages that came out very loudly from the consultation around um, the government's proposed ticket office closures was around accessibility, and particularly for people with disabilities. Um, 
And um, I noticed elsewhere in, in one of the reports so that there was talk about some accessibility audit at stations. Um, so when we look at the map of um, rail station accessibility, there are a significant number of stations across the network where um, it's not, which are not fully accessible and a number which are not step free. Um, so can I really urge that there's a lot more that work is done on that um, and work is done in partnership with interested organisations and that, that that is progressed um, as quickly as possible. Um, and can I also make the point about um, stations with um, audible, audible announcements? I know at one of my stations that's been an issue that's been raised with us and I think it's an issue um, elsewhere and I didn't notice it in the report. Um, but particularly where there are cancelled services, delayed services, it's really important that people can hear um, the announcements and that's an issue that's been raised by passengers so if that can be added to this that would be great thank you thank you councillor some good feedback there uh, Helen would you like to come back on those comments that we made thank you and yes we'll note um, note, note that and we've looked and I kind of make make that update thank you um, and also again with what, um, what was said by councillor McLaughlin in terms of the priorities um, yeah and we'll make sure the Pentagon line is um, presented in there as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Rashaw? Yeah, thank you, and uh, thank you for the report. And um, it's good to see there's been some bits added, I think, based on feedback with the authorities as well. So I know, obviously, everyone names their favourite bit, but I think probably understated in its importance of the Air Valley is the Skipton Cone line. So I'm really pleased that that's been in there. Obviously, worked with your officers as well on a meeting with the CellRap campaign group recently. So we're just pushing the the government to release the feasibility study that's been done around that, which allegedly shows a, a positive case, but they're refusing to take it forward to the next step. Uh, just so thank Leica officers for the, the work with us in pushing that forward. And it's good to see it in the, um, the rail strategy as well, along with, I know it's always hard to be too prescriptive in a strategy because it needs to, some in some cases, kind of reflect things at the time. But um, uh, just keeping open that potential for new stations in places like Leicester Dyke, which we think could just add that extra capacity um, as we have those long-term plans around the interchange and, and a new station, which I think we all accept now is an even stronger case uh, for a new station in Bradford City Centre than it was before. Um, and if we do a £2 billion upgrade to that area, then a new station at Leicester Dyke just outside provides a bit of capacity on that line as we're doing that work. So I think it'll, we think it'd be good value for money to look at that. I'm just pleased that it's kind of kept open as an option in the strategy as well. So thank you for that. Lovely. Thank you very much. So um, with that, then, I propose we accept the recommendations in the report, which is to endorse the revised rail strategy. Uh, and this will be going forward to the combined authority for final approval on the 14th of March. Uh, Councillor yeah. Seconded by Councillor Firth. Thank you very much. All those in favour, please show. That is carried. Thank you very much for that. Um, then finally, just on this agenda, then local transport plan update briefly. Who's that? Yeah, this will be brief. Thank you. Um, we, um, as you know, we're, or as you're aware, we're kind of working through um, a new local transport plan for West Yorkshire. Um, this um, is to set the, what the local transport future plan will look like for, for across all of West Yorkshire, and the districts are currently also working on their transport strategies at the same time, with the exception of Leeds, because Leeds has one in first. Um, we, um, this, what this paper is setting out is our kind of next phase of work within our local transport plan, um, for which we are looking towards to doing a kind of an update to our program, which is a, a two-stage consultation. So our first stage consultation we are looking to go towards, which we're looking to June, um, for that to kind of give a strategic kind of outset, outset and vision for our, our local transport plan and then to come back um, towards the end of the year, starting next year, on more detailed passes. So this paper is um, looking for endorsement from Transport Committee um, to um, allow us to do that process. It's a two-stage two process, isn't it, they're asking for approval for today. Is there any, any comments about that approach? Andrew, yes. Uh, firstly, I'd just like to offer support from the operators here on contributing and being part of that whole I'm um, sure you, you would agree. Uh, I'm just going to talk about coach briefly. So um, we cover coach as well, and often coach is forgotten, and there's two aspects with coach. One, for small operators in West Yorkshire, there's a huge interdependency between bus and coach. You'll see coach operators um, 
uh, running local services and competing for local contracts. And also, there's huge economic benefits to be released, realised, um, and, uh, and heightened through very minimal um, interventions. So it's actually a CPT national policy position to ask uh, local authorities to include a coach section. So I just wanted to plant that seed and we'll be delighted to work with you uh, on that, if that's okay, Helen. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, it's a good point to pick that up, isn't it, really, so it can be incorporated. Thank you for that suggestion. Any more comments, questions? No? Lovely. Well, in that case, um, can we accept the recommendations as they're outlined here and have to recommend that two-stage approach? Uh, Councillor Carlos Second, uh, seconded that. Can I see all those in favour, please show? That is carried. Thank you very much. Um, it only remains for me to say thank you very much for coming today, I believe. And there are no more papers, are there? On no the... That's lovely. Um, and Melanie Corcoran, talking about South West working, uh, Melanie Corcoran is leaving the Combined Authority to go to South Yorkshire, actually. So we're going to have a, a bit of a join up there. And, and she would have been at this meeting, but unfortunately she's able to come today. But she leaves on the 9th of February. So I just want to say thank you from this committee for the seven years of work she's put in obviously uh, delivering at pace a very increasingly large capital programme that we all want to see in our respective places. So uh, thank you very much to uh, Melanie and we wish her well in South Yorkshire and uh, hopefully that leads to better west-south working, uh, which we all endorse. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Okay.